Oh, I, that was an old photo of me. <laughs> So, hello everybody. As the, I guess, Dumbledore announced? I don't know who that's supposed to be. I'm Jeremy Elborn. And I'm Miles Malerba. And we are members of the Angular team, work on Angular material. Today's actually Miles' first day on the Angular team, so I just pulled him up here to have some company while I was on the stage. I didn't want to be alone. Uh, so, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Angular Material, it is a project by the Angular team with the aim of building a high quality set of UI components based on Google's material design spec that anyone can use in their applications. And we aim to use be best practices for Angular and kind of serve as an example for the community. And the project's been going on for about two and a half years, spanning from AngularJS many years ago to Angular today, and over the course of all of those versions and the evolution of the framework, it has built about 50 plus components, tons of commits, and over that time frame, we have learned quite a lot about building components, and we wanted to come up here today to talk about some of the design practices and philosophies that we've developed over time so that you can all take those and go back home and apply them to the, your own components that you're building. And so, diving right in, the first thing I want to talk about is having thoughtful use of custom elements for your Angular components, and more specifically, when not to use custom elements. Um, hold on a second, Jeremy. I thought the whole point of components in Angular is that we can wrap up a whole bunch of stuff inside of a custom element, and then we can just kind of take that custom element and you know, put it anywhere we want in our app. Well, let me show you what I mean. So if you look at a template like this, input element, button element, you know exactly what's going on with this, right? Uh, yeah, this is just normal HTML. Right. So if I just add a little bit to this, some, some attributes, some wrapping elements, you still really know what's going on, right? Uh, I see, yeah. Since the, the user still has access to the native element, uh, they kind of automatically have a feel for your API right away. So for example, if I wanted to add a placeholder to this input that you have here, uh, I know that I can just go ahead and add the placeholder attribute to that native input. I don't have to go through your docs to figure out how to do that. Exactly. This gives the, the user direct access to these DOM elements, and we found that for some components that augmenting the native element like this is more preferable than hiding that element inside of the template in a custom element. Yeah, so this is a, a cool trick for these uh, simple elements like button and input, but does this really apply to much else? Yes, actually, it's not just the, the very simple components like buttons and inputs. Uh, somewhat more complex components can do this as well. For example, if you were to look at tabs, you could see this as being a nav element that contains anchors. And there are other cases where you could apply this same uh, composition of native elements as well. I see. So yeah, this could also work for things like headers and lists and list items. OK, I see. It is pretty cool. Um, so that's neat. I like how we give the user access to an API like they already know how to use, right? We all know how to use HTML. Um, are there any other benefits that we get by doing this? Yeah, absolutely. So let me illustrate one of the benefits that you get by showing a counter example of what would, what would it be like if you didn't do this. So if you were to create a material design button component, the visual treatment for a button that handled both click actions and navigation links, then the person who's consuming this component doesn't really know just by looking at it if it's doing the right thing for accessibility for screen reader users. You would have to look at the source or inspect the elements and make sure it was setting the right roles and ARIA attributes. And this is kind of cumbersome if you want to make sure you're doing the right thing for accessibility. OK, OK, I see what you mean. So if we had gone ahead and used the native button and anchor elements, then it's immediately you know, obvious to the user how this is going to interact with the screen reader. And we know that it's going to be correct, because the screen reader already knows how to handle these native elements without any you know, special roles or area attributes or anything like that. Exactly. And that's not the only benefit. Uh, it also can help make your components simpler, too. And so I'll illustrate this with another counter example of what not to do. Uh, so say we have a, an MD input element that wraps inside of it the, the native input element. 
Uh, hold on a second. I thought you said this was going to be a counterexample. Didn't we do this in Angular Material? Oh, uh, so yeah. There was actually a period of time when in Angular Material we were doing something like this. Uh, this is what our MD input API looked like. And inside the template for that MD input component uh, was something like this. Oh my god, <laughs> that is an awful template. Yeah, so this is forwarding like 20 plus attributes, properties to the native, ele native element from the, the component and it has all the corresponding input properties. And this is making Angular generate a lot of code, run a lot of bindings when really you could avoid this whole thing if you simply give the user access to that native element. And ultimately, we changed our component to do that. So now the user can simply interact directly with this native input element. And it's placed inside of this input container that applies the material design styling and behaviors. Uh, that's certainly much nicer. Oh, OK, so I think I see a lot of benefits to what you're saying here. Uh, we get to you know, give the users a familiar API that they already know how to work with. Uh, it's like an accessibility win, because uh, the, the uh, screen reader already knows how to handle these native elements. And it even simplifies the implementation for us. So great. Um, what do we do, though, in cases where we want to build a component where there's no corresponding native elements, you know, right. things like uh, menus and date pickers and things like that. Right, right. So it's, I'm really glad you asked. Just coincidentally, <laughs> this is one of the things I wanted to talk about next. Uh, this is this idea of having thoughtful component composition. And to illustrate what I want to talk about here, let's start by looking at a menu component, the material design menu. It consists of two different parts. There is the button that user interacts with and the panel that gets popped up once the user has done something. And so I'll ask you, how would you go about, just off the top of your head, coming up with an API, template API for this? Uh, yeah, I think I could do that. So uh, I'd probably do something like this, um, where I'd create this MD menu component. And this will kind of you know, generate the trigger and the panel for us. And then inside of that, we can specify these MD menu item components, where we'll kind of list out all the things we want in our menu. OK, so this is. Uh, encapsulating both the button and the panel part all within one thing. Mm -hmm. So what if I wanted to, say, add a CSS class to that trigger? Um, OK, yeah, I, I can do that. So I would just add an attribute to uh, trigger class. And then you can specify whatever class you want and apply the fancy styles to that. OK, but what if I want to add another uh, class to, say, the, the panel part now and put on a very like, custom shadow on there? Uh, yeah, of course, easy. Um, I'll just add a panel class, and then you can similarly do whatever you want to the panel. Okay. So do you, do you kind of see where I'm going with this? Um, yeah, I guess <laughs> I can see after a while this might bloat the MD menu a bit. Uh, every time I want to do something with the trigger or the panel, I'm kind of stuck adding another attribute on there. Um, but how can I get around this? Right, so what you can do is rather than having the, the gatekeeping for all of the different parts on one element, is just split up the different parts and then connect them. And this is what we're currently doing in Angular Material now, where we have the separate button element that acts as the trigger and the menu panel, and you connect them together via this menu trigger for directive. And this is really nice for users because it allows you to swap out the button for a different button if you want to use it. It allows you to swap out the menu panel for something else and still use it with the same trigger. And ultimately, it provides a lot more flexibility. Uh, OK, yeah, so I can see that uh, that's, that's a pretty cool approach. And you can use that for any kind of you know, more complex component that's made up of interactions between smaller pieces. So you know, things like autocomplete, date picker, and data table. Exactly. So benefits we get from this are pretty nice. So by breaking up your components, you're making your code more clean by having everything very single responsibility. Each, the trigger is just responsible for things related to the trigger. The panel is just related for things related to the panel. Uh, so code organization is better. And as I mentioned, it's much more flexible for the user. And as you saw in our examples, this is also very friendly to the first thing we talked about of using native elements. So now you can still surface those native elements when that's a part of your component API. OK, great. Thanks, Jeremy. I, I think this is really going to help me make you know, better, more flexible APIs for my components. 
Um, but I still have a couple questions related to the implementation. So um, I've been working on this slider component, and I have the DOM for my slider. And I'm finding that there are certain cases where I can't really think of any good solution other than to just directly touch the DOM. <laughs> yeah. So this is something that I'm sure many people in the audience have had to deal with as well, uh, which is why I wanted to talk about how we approach uh, a thoughtful DOM interaction when dealing with Angular components. And so as you know, when you're building an Angular application, all of your user space code is interacting with Angular's APIs, and then Angular abstracts away all of the DOM manipulation and the rendering, so you don't have to deal with it. And this is why we use a framework in the first place, so we don't have to worry about these low-level concerns. However, you might still find yourself, sometimes when you're stuck on a particular problem, wanting to go through that level, level of abstraction and start working directly against the web platform native APIs. Okay, but am I supposed to do this? It feels like some kind of horrible hack. So what we've, we've kind of come to on Angular Material is that there are valid cases when you want to do this. So the first thing that comes up pretty commonly is when you want to do any kind of measuring, sizing, or positioning of elements. This is particularly true when you need to do something uh, around measuring, like get bound and client wrecked, which needs to have all of the CSS that's affecting that element already resolved. Uh, okay, yeah, this is actually exactly the case I had with my slider. Uh, so I wanted this, you know, filled in portion of my slider to uh, depend on the width of the whole thing, but of course I needed to render it out first and have all the CSS applied. So I'm glad to know that it's okay for me to go ahead and measure that using the DOM APIs. Uh, are there any other circumstances where I might want to drop down and use the native DOM APIs? Yeah, yeah, there are a few places. Um, Angular does a really good job of encapsulating everything that it does within the Angular application context and doesn't really deal with the things that are also happening to be on your page. But there may be times as a component author, as an application author, when you want to go outside of that context to find maybe some more information. So an example we have here, is if you're writing a component that maybe needs to have a different behavior based on whether the layout is left to right or right to left, uh, it's pretty common for people to put this dir attribute that sets this on either the root HTML element or on the body element, and so you may find yourself wanting to peek outside of the Angular app to read those things. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I remember Stephen was talking in his keynote about rendering your pages on the server side, and is this gonna cause a problem for that? Yeah, that's a really good concern. So Stephen was mentioning this experimental Angular universe a little bit during the keynote, which is a tool that allows you to pre-render your Angular application on the server so that the user can see something on their browser very, very quickly. And the, the problem, as you noted, is that you don't actually have a DOM to interact with when you're on the server environment. And this is the biggest thing that we are thinking about in Angular Material when we are considering whether or not we are going to interact with the DOM in a certain case or what we, we're keeping in mind. And we found in looking through all of the components and what they're doing that times when we need to drop down to the native APIs fall into two categories. There's things that happen only in response to user interaction with the application and things that have to happen on the initial render of a component. Okay, I think I see where you're going with this. So if it happens in response to a user interaction, that's never gonna happen when we're rendering on the server, right? So it should be okay to just go ahead and do things inside there. Exactly, the user is never going to be able to click a button or scroll the page while the application is pre-rendering. Those can only happen once the application has been bootstrapped and is running on the browser. Okay, uh, unfortunately it sounds like maybe my slider uh, case falls into the other category since I want that filled in section to be you know, correct right away. Right, and so this is a little trickier uh, in order to do something on initial render. Uh, ideally you want to avoid situations like this as much as possible, but you may still find times when you absolutely have to 
do some DOM manipulation in order to get things to look exactly right on that initial render, and measuring something that's affected by CSS is one of the most common cases for this. And Angular Universal will provide a way eventually to provide these very small JavaScript snippets that you'll be able to run on the client on top of your pre-rendered application that can do little fix-ups like this on top of the pre-rendered code where you need to measure. Ah. <laughs> so another thing that we uh, really need to, to make clear before we go any further talking about DOM, especially in the context of the last talk that just came up, is when you are dealing directly with DOM APIs, you have to be very, very careful about the types of interactions that you have. Angular has really good protections built into it to guard against XSS vectors in your application. And if you circumvent Angular's APIs and start building large swaths of your application on your own, then you open the door to all sorts of vulnerabilities in your application. So you want to avoid trying to, to build out uh, much of your app that way. Okay, yeah, that sounds kind of scary. So I'll try to just stick to simple things like, uh, you know, adding and removing styles and adding event listeners. Yeah, so reiterating on this, when it comes to dealing with dominant Angular applications, avoid it when it's possible. Prefer using Angular APIs. Uh, but you may still encounter some situations where it's necessary to use the, the platform native APIs. And when you do find these situations, be very careful, watch out for XSS, and be mindful of what you're doing and whether or not it is going to play nicely with tools like Angular Universal for pre-rendering. Uh, OK, thanks, Jeremy. I think uh, now I've pretty much got everything I need to go start making us some great components for Angular Material. Well, there, there is one more thing I wanted to talk about in this talk before we ran out of time, which is the Angular Zone. The what? Uh, in particular, <laughs> having thoughtful interactions with that Angular zone. Uh, so if you, if you don't know what it is, uh, zone is something that Angular depends on. It provides an asynchronous execution context for the Angular application. Uh, I literally have no idea what that means. <laughs> So you, you don't really have to know the full story, but what you can kind of see it as is zones are Angular's way of knowing about everything that happens in your application or caused by your application, even asynchronous things like set timeout and XML HTTP request. And as component authors, you're wondering what can you do with it. The primary reason you would interact with the zone is to have some more control over when change detection runs, since zones is what drives uh, Angular deciding to run change detection. I see. So then in that case, could I use the, the Angular zone to disable change detection when I don't want it? So for example, maybe I'm uh, repositioning a tooltip as I scroll, and I just want to do this by you know, directly updating the DOM. Uh, and I don't want change detection. Is there some way I could do that? Right. So you can inject the ng zone into your component, and it has this method on it, run outside Angular. And anything that you run in here is going to run outside of the Angular zone application context, and thus won't cause change detection. So in the example that you were just talking about, you could add an event listener in here for scroll to recenter your tooltip. And whenever the scroll happens, you're not going to be running change detection, which obviously could slow down your application. Another really common case for doing this is if you are dealing with request animation frame and running some custom animation. You definitely don't want to be running change detection on every frame of an animation. So using this, you can avoid that unintended slowdown on your application. OK, well, now like I certainly know everything I need to get started. I, I know to be thoughtful about my custom elements and when to use them and when not to use them. And I know to uh, think carefully about how my elements compose and work together. And I know to be careful with my DOM interaction. Uh, if I'm going to have to interact with it directly, you know, watch out for XSS, um, watch out for uh, Angular Universal. And then I know to be thoughtful about my use of the Angular Zone. Right. Well, the there's a few more things you should probably know of about building applications. Uh, 
but we don't have time to talk about those today. So be sure to follow our progress on Angular material where we are uh, applying a lot of these practices and learning new ones as we go. These slides are available at the short link, and I will also mention it's not actually Miles' first day on the Angular team. That was a narrative device for the talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>